I'm a professional valuer, manager, and a leader in the industry of real estate. Uh, I'm, I also have uh, outside interests, which are I'm, uh, I'm founder and a member of the uh, board of the Canadian Serbian Business Association. And I'm one of the founders and president uh, uh, of the disciplinary committee of the Serbian Association of Valuers. Uh, I was once upon a time the head of uh, valuation for JLL, uh, managing director of two Unicredit owned firms. Uh, and now I'm managing director of Atrium Property Services. Uh, in, terms, in terms of what, uh, about Atrium Property Services, I'll leave this up to Roman, a little bit of introduction for him. Uh, viewers, if you have any questions, please send me by the chat function. Uh, and uh, just state who the question's for. So Corona is the flavor of the day. It's affecting our daily lives and challenges uh, and challenges our future. It's not going to disappear tomorrow. Just uh, in a small comparison, uh, yesterday Canada had 3,800 uh, cases. Uh, Germany had 8,300 cases and Serbia had 4,800 cases. So even though we're being vaccinated, it's still a fairly prevalent problem. This is positively and negatively affects the commercial markets. We have shutdowns of commercial of, uh, shopping malls. Uh, we have uh, failing of small businesses, restaurants. But on the other hand, there are some some companies that are doing positive things, pharmaceutical companies, companies that make masks. So there is still business going on. Uh, with me today is uh, Ivan Gazdic, Infrastructure and Real Estate Committee President of the uh, Foreign Investors Council, and he works for CMS. Uh, Mr. Roman Klott, uh, Managing Director of HM Property Services. Anna Petrovic, Head of Expansion Sector in Lidl, Serbia. Ivan Rajkovic, Director, Transaction and Portfolio Management of Poseidon Group. Milica Mitrovic, uh, Asset Manager in GTC. Neboša Nešepanovic, Senior Director, Head of Valuation of CBRE. I'd like to start uh, to put Neboša in the hot seat uh, Nebusha, please start with a short introduction of yourself and CBRE, and then uh, tell us, uh, uh, give us a, a short uh, assessment of the commercial real estate markets, and not just in uh, Belgrade, but I think in, in the region, I think there's, there's reason for everybody to know. Okay. Hvala, brave. Nastavit ću na srpskom, ako je to svima okej. Ja sam Nebojša Nešovanović, rukovodilac odeljenja procena CBRI-a. Pokrivamo iz Beograda, Beograd nam je regionalna kancelarija i pokrivamo jugoistočnu Evropu od osam zemalja, znači bivša SFRJ Republike, Bugarsku i Albaniju. Na tržištu sam 18 godina sada, tako da dosta dugo pratim razvoj tržišta. Što se tržišta tiče, trudit ću se da se ne ponavljam u odnosu na ono što je već rečeno. Znači, svi su bili prilično optimistični, a svi prethodni govornici. Finansijska situacija je dosta dobra. Evropska centralna banka i Fed nastavljaju ekspanzivnu monetarnu politiku. Kamatne stope su na rekordno niskom nivou. Inflacija je na niskom nivou i zaočekivati je da se to i nastavi. Vrednosti nekretnina, odnosno cene kojima se prometuju nekretnine su prilično stabilne, s tim što pojedine grupe nekretnina, pre svega logistika, imaju rast vrednosti u prethodnih 12 meseci. Njima je korona čak i pogodovala. Najveći gubitnici su naravno hoteli i ta ugostiteljska industrija, a mimo hotela naravno tu je malo prodaja, naročito tržni centri. Posle toga dolaze kancelarijski prostori koji trpe takođe i očekuje se da imaju štete u nekom narednom periodu. Pre svega kada pričamo o stabilnosti vrednosti nekretnina ili cena nekretnina, to treba staviti u relaciju sa vrednosti ostalih kapitalnih dobara. Ja bih rekao da iako su vrednosti nekretnina nominalno na sličnom nivou tamo gde su bile i pre 12 meseci, 
ostala kapitalna dobra su značajno porasti. Kada pogledate berze, uporazite sve svetske berze, one su u odnosu na pik neposredno pre korone skočile barem 30%. U odnosu na period pre dve godine one su skočile 50%. Sve te kompanije rade lošije ili u najboljem slučaju slično kao što su radile pre 12 ili 24 meseca, a vrede 30 do 50 procenata više. Posmatrajući to, nekretnine koje posluju na sličan način kako su poslovale pre 12 meseci ili imaju nekakve kratkotrajne gubitke koje i dalje imaju sličnu cenu, postaju neuporedivo povoljnija investicija nego što su to akcije na berz. I s tog razloga možemo očekivati veći fokus od strane investitora u oblast nekretnina i gledanje mnogo više nekretnina za investicije nego što smo to imali u prethodnih 12 meseci. To kada se nastavi očekivano ekspanzivna monetarna politika od svih značajnih učesnika na tržištu. Sada ne bih išao pretjerano detaljno u različite segmente nekretnina zato što ima dosta govornika, imamo dosta ograničeno vreme, ali rečeno je već da je logistika veliki pobednik i da prvi put ćemo gledati da su stop povraće, odnosno yieldovi za logistiku ispod yieldova za kancelarijske prostore i to je nešto što gledamo. Tržište stambenih nekretnina postaje vrlo atraktivno, kod nas je već dosta dugo, ali i na drugim zapadnim tržištima. U stavima i na zapadu već počinju da gledaju, počinju da ih posmatraju kao kapitalne investicije, ne kao samo mesta za kupovinu, za život, naručito od kad su berze skočile i berze su na vrlo visokom nivou. Dosta ljudi koji imaju stotine hiljada ili niske milione razmatraju da kupuju stanove takođe na razvijenim tržištima gde postoji razvijeno finansijsko tržište. Retail je tema dosta dugo i on se transformiše sam po sebi, nevezano od COVID-a. COVID je samo ubrzao tu situaciju s tim što imamo vrlo jasnu sliku u šta će se retail transformisati u nekom narednom periodu, verovatno 3 do 5 godina, tako da se investitori već osjećaju prilično komotno sa retailom i očekujemo priličan povratak investitora u segment retaila, pre svega tržnih centara, pošto iz retail parkova nikad nisu ni odlazili. I najveće pitanje su kancelari, kancelarijski prostori. Svi smo znali negde da će tržište kancelarija da se menja i da idemo ka digitalizaciji i ka nekom online radu, s tim što je to COVID neuporedivo ubrzao i stavio nas barem tri ili pet godina ranije u neku poziciju u kojoj smo trebali da budemo. I svi znamo da sada možemo da radimo online i da možemo da se sastajemo online, što pre godinu dana već nismo praktikovali. I pitanje je kako će se to odraziti na kancelarije. Prvo je koliko je učinkovit rad od kuće koji sada praktikujemo i koliko nam se sviđa ovaj rad od kuće. S tim što istraživanja koje smo sproveli u Poljskoj i Češkoj govore da negde trećina radnika preferira da radi iz kancelarije i produktivnije iz kancelarija kako ih danas poznajemo. Trećina ljudi je indiferentna i smatra da su isto produktivni i kod kuće i u kancelarije i jedna trećina smatra da je produktivnija od kuće. Ovo nam ostavlja samo prostor i daje nam smernice kako kancelarijsko tržište treba da se menja, kako treba da se diversifikuje i kako treba da zadovolji potrebe i ljudi kojima standardne kancelarije ne odgovaraju. Ta diversifikacija se pre svega očekuje u manje popularnim, da kažemo, kancelarijama, znači flagship lokacije, najkvalitetnije kancelarije, očekujemo da će ostati kakve i jesu, da će tu sedeti najkvalitetnije firme i da će to biti kako jeste, dok će manje atraktivna i manje privlačna kancelarija, da kažemo, za zakup, morati da nalaze neka alternativna rešenja da bi zadovoljila i taj gap, da tu rupu na tržištu, tu nezadovoljenu potrebu. Od mene za sada je toliko da bih ostavio vremena i za drugo. Druge, brale, na tebi je. You are mute. Ok. Great, thank you, Nevesha. So, Ivan, please give us just a short description and I just want to answer the question uh, from a legal point of view, uh, what were the challenges during the previous 12 months for the real estate investor and the and bank financing and real estate projects? 
Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, well, uh, speaking of the challenges, um, uh, we definitely had uh, real estate m and transactions and uh, real estate project financing in the past 12 months. And uh, there were several things that uh, uh, came up um, during the pandemic. Um, for example, when m and real estate transaction is conducted, uh, the longer the period from the signing and the closing is, uh, uh, there, is a, um, there is more risk uh, whether uh, you will end up in another state of emergency or how tenants will behave, whether this will trigger a uh, so-called MAC clause. This is material adverse change clause, which means that the, the, the buyer is protected uh, not, not to close the transaction in case uh, something happens between the signing and the closing. So all that uncertainty during, uh, during the, the pandemic uh, uh, was not helpful at all. Um, when it comes to real estate project financing, we see that now almost all valuations, now they have um, this COVID disclaimer. So we are not sure how this will uh, 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 affect in, in, in some uh, uh, future period, the, the true value of the real estate. So maybe we can, we can have words on that uh, in, in the last panel, I think it's about evaluations. Um, this is a very, uh, uh, it, this is directly linked with the long to value uh, uh, as one of the financial uh, covenant uh, from the project financing that was discussed from, from the previous panel. Uh, again, uh, lease agreements were also affected. Some uh, tenants were very, uh, uh, were uh, like eager to, to have rent reductions, to have new rent-free periods. And uh, uh, rent income is definitely uh, the key uh, point for servicing the debt. So this is not only uh, an issue for investors, but also an issue for, uh, for banks. And uh, maybe the last thing that I would like to mention, yes, this sense still or moratorium, how was it called in Serbian language? was introduced, but the problem was uh, that all real estate projects are uh, huge and they have a syndicate of many uh, lenders. Uh, they have uh, foreign lenders as well. So this stand still uh, definitely was not applicable for as automatic, uh, uh, automatic solution for those projects. So uh, even uh, just give a little uh, brief introduction of yourself and, and your firm. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yes, okay. my name is, <laughs> I thought, yeah, uh, Ivan Gazi is partner in CMS Law Firm, and I'm also president of the real estate and uh, uh, actually infrastructure and real estate committee of the Foreign Investors Council in Serbia. Great, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ivan Rajkovic. Uh, you have a professional background uh, in, in banking. Uh, which effects uh, is COVID-19 having on financing of real uh, retail assets? And are banks asking for more frequent valuations or uh, LTV changes, anything like that? Hi, just a, thanks. Thanks, just Brian. Just a introduction of yourself first. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, hi everyone. My name is Ivana Rajkovic. I'm the Director of Transaction and Portfolio Management uh, of Poseidon Group, whom I joined, well, almost four years ago now to lead the global operations across the SE region. And I'm actually coming from the banking sector. I was with Erste Bank for almost 12 years before that, specifically actually in the, in the company that was financing big real estate project. Projects. So one of my main tasks actually and main responsibilities within Poseidon as well is handling our key financial institutions and our investment partners. So I think I can give you a pretty good insight into our experience with the, with the COVID and with the banks and, and what their reaction was to the whole situation. Uh, especially seeing as we have developed and we have a lot of projects uh, currently under management, we are constantly trying to you know, keep in touch with the banks to see how their strategies are changing, what their requirements are, and to try to 
give them our input from the market of, of what is going on and how things are changing for them to have a better feel of, of what is going on as well. And I have to say that they have been very, very positively uh, accommodating to clients and they have reacted quite quickly uh, when this whole thing started last year. Uh, as uh, Ivan already mentioned, uh, they have uh, approved these so-called moratoriums or standstills for, for clients without them even having to ask for it. I understand that in a lot of cases it wasn't uh, easy to uh, get those through, but it was very helpful, especially for us across our portfolio, having those couple of months where there was uncertainty and we didn't know how the situation is going to develop, not to have to worry about uh, paying loan installments and, and so on. Uh, this has, of course, affected the bank's thinking and the way they are making their plans. And I think it has put a little bit of breaks uh, in terms of their uh, appetites for new volumes. And it has tightened their requirements a bit when it comes to financing. I wouldn't say that there's been a very significant change, but there is again a little bit of an increase in the requirements when it comes to debt service coverage ratios, when it comes to L when it comes to LTVs, when it comes to the frequency of delivering valuations. They have uh, sharpened these requirements a little bit, but this is definitely not as bad as it was when the real estate crisis in 2008 hit, because this is not basically. A financial crisis. The banks are well capitalized. Uh, they invest conservatively. So MPLs in the amount that appeared on the market back then uh, are definitely not going to be appearing now. Uh, I would just say that maybe new players on the market are going to have it a little bit more difficult if they don't have a track record uh, with a bank, because this is one of the things that the, the bank is always asking for, your previous experience, your track record, either with them or with someone else, but that you have projects that have already been completed. And I think that it was mentioned in the, in the previous panel as well, where does your first million come from? You know, it's always, if it's the chicken or the egg first, you need to have something to show for in order to be able to get financing for your next project. But what if it's your first, then, then you, have a little bit of a difficulty, but in general, I think the banks have been uh, have definitely been a partner to uh, to investors and and developers in this whole situation. It sounds like this is a good evidence that the banks have learned something from this uh, 2008 crisis, how to handle shock uh, a little bit better, uh, being able to react faster. This is uh, this is a good sign of a, a maturing economy. Yeah, uh, good experience. For yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, they are still banks, you know, being annoying and being slow. But uh, I have to say, it, it's it's uh, it was really uh, a good uh, standpoint standpoint that they took, and and they were very helpful in the crisis. Yeah, great, great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Roman, uh, my question to you is, is uh, the COVID crisis changed the way the office market is working? Nebusha, Nebusha touched on that a little bit. Uh, maybe you could just uh, expand. Yes, uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, myself and the company. I, uh, I'm the founder of Atrium and I founded the company in 2005. And since then, we are focusing a lot on managing properties. That's maybe our specialty. So uh, we are involved in the daily operation of office buildings, of uh, a lot of residential lately, and also a bit of logistics space. And uh, we have a lot of insight into what is uh, really happening on, uh, let's say, on the ground. And actually, uh, what we have seen is uh, that, um, yeah, surprisingly, uh, things are more normal than I would have expected. A year ago, almost exactly a year ago, uh, we were panicking and uh, we didn't know what will happen uh, next week. But um, let's say this year has taught us a lesson that actually uh, we are very adaptive and uh, we, can, we can also operate in uh, difficult uh, situations. Uh, basically, what I can see uh, in the in, in the office buildings is they are pretty empty. Uh, many many companies uh, have their stuff still sitting at home, so so the real physical occupancy is maybe 20, 30 percent, uh, and uh, 
this is hitting especially um, retailers again, as those ones who have a little restaurant nearby who are living from uh, living from uh, from the consumption of the office users, uh, they have the biggest problems. Uh, towards the office tenant itself, I have to say uh, that not much has changed. Uh, of course, landlords gave a bit of rent freeze and a bit of benefits here and there and, uh, and basically helped to make it a bit easier uh, to, to those tenants. But what did not happen is that rents massively dropped, uh, the, tenants had to, uh, the tenants moved out, that we have huge vacancy. We are still somewhere between, I would say, uh, above 90%, uh, maybe even closer to the 95%. And um, that's, let's say, caused by, by lease agreements, which are just not breakable so, so easily. So, and the other cause is that, that uh, office occupiers are also a bit um, driving the direction of look and see what will happen. Uh, let's say everybody expected it's, it's going to be a short-term crisis. Now uh, it took, takes a bit longer and uh, things will look a bit different uh, next year and the year after, I believe. Great, thank you, Roman. Uh, Melita, uh, since we're on the office subject uh, and you have uh, experience in retail and office, um, has leasing suffered during the pandemic? Uh, can you compare office and, and retail since uh, you guys are owners mainly of office uh, developments, but you also have uh, at a mall? So let me just introduce myself. Uh, I am the ASP manager of the GTC uh, as from uh, 10 months ago. Uh, I am, uh, uh, well, I'm in the GTC uh, Serbia office portfolio, the asset manager, but uh, I have the experience in the retail in my previous company, uh, Poseidon. I was the associate director of the retail asset management portfolio, uh, asset management uh, team in Serbia. Um, Basically, I do believe that all of you know, so just to highlight about the GTC, uh, GTC is operating and own, uh, owns and operates more than 120,000 square meter of the uh, office uh, uh, GLA in Serbia uh, and uh, 35,000 square meter of the retail space um, in, uh, well, Adam Mall. Uh, so basically, back to the question, uh, I must say that uh, I agree practically with uh, Roman. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we witnessed in the beginning, uh, there was a slight delay in the decision making process when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the tenants. Uh, basically, uh, everybody was afraid how the situation is going to look like, uh, how long the pandemic is going to uh, last, and uh, there were they were actually not able to oblige themselves for long-term uh, lease agreements. Uh, but uh, this is something that happened in the beginning when everybody was uh, feeling insecure. But uh, given that uh, this takes for a year now, uh, the uh, companies are practically done with waiting. They want to come back uh, uh, to the, well, they want to oblige themselves on the le uh, leasing of the premises and they want to uh, start their business and uh, move forward. Uh, so basically we are now witnessing that uh, the decisions are being uh, brought uh, faster and uh, the vacancy rate hasn't dropped uh, so much, it's just a um, few percents that we uh, noticed so far, and uh, the rent collection was excellent. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the physical presence in the, uh, in the buildings, uh, it is a bit low now, but uh, starting as of 2021, it's getting better, regardless that uh, numbers of the infected people are also getting <laughs> higher. Um, so when it comes to retail, uh, I must say that the retail, uh, retail is definitely uh, suffering more, uh, especially the shopping malls, but it's very important to highlight that uh, there is a huge difference at this moment between the shopping malls and retail parks, uh, because uh, it turned out that the main advantage of the retail parks is their accessibility and uh, actually the, the open space uh, in front of the shops and the direct access. Uh, which is uh, well in the in the shopping malls different, and uh, in the measures taken by the government, it's uh, uh, well um, adjusted. Uh, it is uh, like uh, sorted as uh, the most uh, the most um, dangerous part of the business. Uh, 
Um, but regardless, we do, we do feel that uh, that when, when when the measures were lifted for a couple of periods of times uh, in this uh, in this last year, we saw that uh, practically the people are very interested in coming back to the shops and that they uh, lack this part of their routine. They lack. Uh, having some entertainment uh, with their um, entertainment uh, time with their family and friends. So we hope this will come back to, to where it was. Great. Thank you. So Anna, uh, a little bit about yourself. Kako je korona utjecala na nju i nekretinu u Lidu? Bravo, Brian. Uh, pa evo, ja ću ukratko da kažem nešto o sebi, pošto sam sigurna da u Lidlu uh, svi znate veoma dobro. Uh, ja sam Ana Petrović, zadužena sam za razvoj mreže uh, Lidl prodavnica, konkretno u gradu Beogradu. Uh, dobila sam neka šaljiva pitanja apropo Lidla i učešće na ovoj konferenciji, zašto Lidl, da nije profula u Lidl možda ovaj, konferenciju, ali ne, Lidl se jako ozbiljno bavi nekretinama i to vidite do sada ovaj, brojem otvorenih prodavnica u, u, u Srbiji. Ne pričamo ovdje samo o Beogradu, pričamo o, o teritoriji cijele Srbije. I s obzirom da smo operativni negdje od kraja 2018. godine, mi do sada imamo 47 otvorenih uh, filijala, još nekih desetak trenutno u izgradnji, još mnogo, mnogo, mnogo njih u pripremi. Što znači da ja ovdje predstavljam jedan ozbiljan tim za nekretine, koji je onako prilično uspješan u, u, na cijeloj teritoriji. I evo, vrlo sam srećena da mogu da podijelim sa, sa vama naša iskustva. Prost, proteka godina nije bila baš, ajde da kažemo, uobičajena. Niko nije naviknut na, na sve to što nam se dešavalo. Lidl kao ogroman sistem i kao kompanija koja trenutno u Srbiji broji nešto više od 2200 zaposlenih. Znate i sami koliko je teško brzo odreagovati na, na bilo kakve promjene u okruženju. A mi smo praktično tokom protekle godine imali promjene maltene i na, i na dnevnoj pa, bazi u samom početku. Tako da udar veliki na, na organizaciju. Ja mislim da je cijeli supply chain bio o, vrlo pogođen. I ne može se tu samo reći da je jedan konkretan sektor bio, e, ajde da kažem, najviše izložen tim, tim poteškoćama. Naš zadatak je bio e, jako odgovoran. Mi smo tu da ponudimo za naše kupce a, proizvode koji su im svakodnevno potrebni, da obezvijedimo da, da se nama može lako pristupiti, da se može sigurno obaviti kupovina i sigurna sam da su, a, da su došli do izražaja ta lokoća i jednostavnost kupovine kod nas. Tako da, u suštini, šta bih mogla da kažem kako je uticala korona na nekretnine u Lidlu? Pa... Zahvaljujući našim poslovnim partnerima u oblasti gradnje, mi smo uspjeli da, da sva otvaranja koja smo i planirali prije, prije pandemije, da uspješno privedemo kraju, to je da dovedemo do otvaranja. Mislim da je gradnja bila prva linija fronta. Može se slobodno staviti negdje u red sa, sa prodajom koja je bila vrlo izložena. Tu ne imamo home office ni u gradnji, ni u prodaji. Tu moramo biti prisutni jel tako, na, na licu mjesta. Kolege iz, iz nabavke, iz logistike, transport je jako bio izazovan u, u tom periodu. Svi smo onako pružili maksimum od sebe i uspješno odgovorili na sve, na sve poteškoće koje smo imali. Što se tiče samih nekretnina i kupovine, Lidl svoju aktivnost nije apsolutno usporio, naprotiv. Mi smo dali pun gas jer smo vidjeli da je neophodno da kupac ima mogućnost da što brže i lakše kupuje, tako da smo mi onako otvaranja poželjeli malo i da ubrzamo. Kupovina ide svojim, svojim tokom. Nismo primijetili pad aktivnosti u oblasti kupovine nekretnina. Nismo primijetili ni pad cijena. Složila bi se tu sa prethodnim panelistima. Posebno sa Ervinom i njegovim entuzijazmom. Ja negdje dijelim ovaj, taj entuzijazam u oblasti nekretnina što se tiče cijelog našeg regiona. Mislim da ima veliki potencijal i da će tu tek da dođe tek ćemo da se iznenadimo kako, ovaj, kako se um, ajde, kažem, nekretnine u, u ovom regionu kako će da prođu. Um, ja se deset godina bavim nekretninama u, u okviru kompanije Lidl i mogu da vam kažem da sam fascinirana konkretno mojim poslom u Beogradu jer to nijedna lokacija ne je ista, svaka je za sebe različita i prosto je stalno... Um, interesovanje na velikom nivou, jako je zanimljivo, 
ali i uspješno mogu da kažem. Nije najlakše, slažem se, ali je jako onako izazovno. Tako da uživam. Yeah, super, baš mi je drago. <laughs> bravo, za, bravo za srpski jezik. <laughs> <laughs> hvala. hvala. Uh, sledeće pitanje uh, za Ivana. Uh, Poseidon Group has, uh, has been investing in retail parks, obviously in CE for over a decade now. It seems to be a common sentiment that retail parks have been dealing with a pandemic quite well. Can you confirm or explain the sentiment? Uh, yes, hi. I can definitely confirm this. I think Milica already addressed the topic a little bit. Uh, let me just yeah. add that uh, next to retail parks, we have also invested into shopping centers and standalone uh, food stores. Uh, and in this whole situation in the pandemic, when it started last year, we saw that retail parks were definitely the ones that had it the easiest, I would say, to adapt to the new situation. Uh, and one of the key advantages that I would point out is uh, something that Milic already said, this is the layout of a retail park. You have mm -hmm. all the shops out in the open, so the, the customer can enter into each shop separately directly from the parking lot. And this is a big advantage compared to shopping malls where you have a lot of common areas where the stores are all next to each other. There's a big hallway where people meet, people are together. Here you have them separate. You can limit the number of people in each store. You have a separate entrance. This has proven to be a big asset of retail parks in the, in the pandemic. Uh, also the management of a retail park, the expenses of and the, the so-called I can't remember the, the right term in, in English, uh, is way lower in a retail park. There mm -hmm. are expenses that you can just not cancel regardless of whatever is happening. You have to pay these. And this, is, this has been easier for retail parks to manage. And I have to admit that our tenants have been very supportive in this as well because they've never ever complained about paying the service charges. This was always paid, it was always settled, so it made the whole uh, situation way, way easier. Uh, so yeah, basically, uh, I'd say that, and I think Nebosha also mentioned this in his introduction that the retail parks in the retail segment have definitely come out as winners uh, from, from this whole situation. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you for that. So we have, we have retail parks that are probably uh, one of the big winners, uh, or at least not big losers uh, in this pandemic. Uh, hotels are probably overall the biggest losers at this point. Logistics, um, you know, with logistics, I think uh, logistics has done quite well because you obviously, uh, one, one thing like uh, the Lidl's and the Delays are still operating quite well. Um, you know, they still need a lot of storage to store their goods. So I think, and then you get a lot of online shopping now. Uh, I've probably done more online shopping uh, in the last year than I've done in my entire life. So this is obviously uh, a big advantage. Uh, next question is for uh, Ivan. Uh, what advice would you uh, give real estate investors and lenders uh, what they should pay attention to when conducting a transaction during the pandemic? Uh, yes. Well, uh, for, uh, I mean, uh, obviously lenders should definitely pay attention and not only lenders, uh, investors as well to the type of commercial real estate that is uh, the, the winner, as you said. Uh, so logistics and retail parks. Uh, we see that the bank uh, banks uh, will uh, not uh, so eager to continue with financing the hotel industry or the office space, uh, but we'll see whether this will this will change. Um, when when yes, when conducting the transaction in those uh, extraordinary circumstances, uh, all parties are willing to uh, have um, some kind of flexibility and to. Uh, the buyer wish definitely to uh, exit the transaction, not to close, uh, if uh, there is uh, some extraordinary event um, happening. Uh, but on the other hand, um, 
the seller is uh, willing to close the transaction no matter what is happening. So uh, depending on uh, whether you are working for a buy side or for the sell side, uh, you can yes uh, tailor tailor your um, your advice. Um, what I feel is that uh, we are moving towards uh, green energy, green buildings, uh, green leases. Sustainability is also the word that you can hear um, all the time now. So all those projects which involve um, which involve uh, features of uh, commercial real estate buildings which are in harmony with the nature will be attractive not only to tenants but to lenders to um, to provide the financing for for those projects. Great, great, thank you, uh, Roman. How do you how do you see the office market developing and changing? in the next few years? Do you see any major changes? Do you think uh, people will expand, reduce their office space, those types of things? Well, we heard in an earlier panel that uh, uh, one, or no, actually Nebersh uh, said this, uh, one third of the, of the employees can imagine to stay at home, not to come back to the office. Uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of that because um, uh, let's say the workplace of those one third of people will be transformed into some other areas. So actually what, what companies will have to do, they have to adapt their office. It has to become, uh, let's say more, yeah, more healthy. Yeah, it has to be, uh, let's say, more, uh, it has to be prepared for better communication. So I think this classical office where you have your desk uh, and uh, and you're coming in in the morning, leaving in the evening uh, will change, uh, but it, it will become much more flexible, much more adaptable. And uh, let's say the effect on the, on the office market, I don't think it will be so big. Uh, things will change um, in the way that uh, in, in, let's say, maybe not not in every city, but in, in, in larger cities, companies will rent uh, different places. They will have different offices. They will not unify everything at one place anymore. Uh, they will offer their, their employees maybe to work from a, uh, from a flex office uh, center close to their home, because uh, to work from home, many employees don't like to do or cannot do because they live together with uh, grandparents, with family, and um, they don't have conditions to, for work. So uh, let's say it will change the way how the office market is look like, but it will not, um, the office market or the offices will not become obsolete at all. I, I rather believe it will, it will be redistributed, uh, new ideas will, will come, uh, adaptation will be made, and, uh, and at, the end, um, yeah, it, at the end, the office will continue to be what it is, um, the office where you work. And um, basically, uh, what we what we also have noticed now, especially in this situation, is that that service is very important. And um, let's say it's it's now obvious that hygiene is a topic. So so basically, uh, instead of having less to clean, we have much more to clean. So basically, we have more people doing uh, doing the job uh, which was done before. We have to disinfect areas. We have to maybe implement some projects of contactless entry. Uh, so, so I think for for our well, let's say for the professional service companies, it's actually an opportunity to do new things and different things, and that's why I'm not afraid uh, of of the future. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, good. You're mentioning like uh, you're cleaning you're you're cleaning a lot more. You're cleaning maybe with some different products also. What what other things can you bring to investors, owners of buildings? Um, you can even expand to residential, obviously, also, I know it's a commercial panel, but, but there's something where you can add to uh, residential. What, what value do, do you bring to these um, owners? Well, uh, on, uh, let's, besides, besides the hygienic uh, stuff, which was really, really very much in focus in the past year, uh, many many things can be can be done better uh, than it was done before. So we have uh, IT services now. Uh, we can actually uh, let's say improve our service delivery with with applications. Uh, let's say tenant apps. Uh, we can and what we did in in some of our projects, we introduced uh, basically um, yeah uh, electronic billing uh, uh, possibilities over an application. So. 
owners can pay their community bills basically directly from the mobile phone. They don't have to go to the bank branch or stand in a queue at the post, which uh, is really annoying. And I, I think step by step this will come into Serbia too. It's it's a bit slow here because um, let's say it's uh, Serbia is lagging a bit behind in IT development, but uh, but I see it coming right now. So. So uh, basically, IT side is very important. Uh, integrate more, uh, let's say, software. Have a very nice, customer-friendly um, applications running. Uh, let's say, makes the service easier. That's very, very important, I think. And then on the on the real service execution side, we we also see a big change, uh, especially in the upmarket projects or upscale projects. We have much more uh, inquiries for high-quality service and. Uh, we, we introduced a concierge service, for instance, for, for apartment owners, which they can use at their discretion. And um, uh, that's, I think, completely new and is changing a bit how, how property is, uh, is taken care of. Great, great, thank you. Um, yes, one second. Raleigh, if you want, I can step in about it. Uh, yeah, I can uh, just expand this, uh, what Roman just mentioned. Uh, Please. We are all on the same side, same page, uh, meaning we are quite opposite about future. I would just like to emphasize that uh, uh, change, uh, speed of change uh, is becoming more important. So mm -hmm. not developing office building, uh, signing 10 or 15 year lease and sitting on it, just issuing a once a month uh, invoice. So it's more about customers and each employee yeah. inside is a customer about their happiness. Uh, so we would need to work as asset managers way more to satisfy new generations working in office building similar like with retail space. So it's not just bringing a good, good blue chip company name, uh, signing long term and you are ending up there. You just need to listen what your customer wants. And it's not 20, 20th century type of listening, meaning uh, taking surveys and making focus groups and this kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm like Google type of research, everyone is telling you what they want on their smartphone and what they are listening, what they are searching for. Uh, so you exactly can know all your tenants in the building, what they are looking for and uh, what's satisfying them, what's not satisfying them. And it's way more about be, being proactive and uh, listening what your clients want, each individual ones, not just CEOs uh, and going forward that. And I would expect that in following five or 10 years, we are going to see the huge difference between a landlords who's doing proactive and who's doing smart asset management and who's just sitting there expecting they need to send just one invoice a month or just invoice about rent a month, not changing anything. And all changes in a building, meaning you don't need to upgrade heating, ventilation, air conditioning, or to change a carpet. You need to do way more. And real estate is becoming, as almost any other uh, industry in digital era, very more dynamic. Uh, you need to adjust on a daily basis and just to listen what your clients want. It's a lot about community. It's gone in this direction. It's uh, You basically have to create a positive community where uh, basically you you, um, yeah, you can, you can, um, uh, let's say, follow up the thoughts and the feedback from from your customers. It's interesting. There, many landlords will not be uh, will not be able to do that because uh, they are not organized in this way, or they are not, uh, they don't have the, uh, yeah, the background to manage such kind of progress uh, and change. But it's gonna happen, yeah. Definitely. Uh, <clears throat> uh, sure. what? Uh... You know, obviously, uh, Seaberry is the largest real estate service provider in the world. Uh, what um, what's what's the investor interest? What are you seeing? What asset classes are people coming to look at? Are you seeing uh, more uh, domestic or foreign interest now? Um, maybe maybe it's a lot less uh, foreign interest because of the the ability to travel. Uh, but still, we have uh, we've been doing a lot in the last few years. Um, 
survey so ex marketing? That's, that's an excellent question. And uh, one uh, part of the question is what investors in Western Europe or more developed markets are looking. So yeah. there are three types of assets they are looking at the moment. First one is logistic, which is straightforward and easy. Second one is alternative investments, meaning uh, elderly homes and student domestics. So they are looking for uh, income producing, prof uh, prof profit generating assets where the people are living on a, for a few years or more than that. And the third, they are again waiting and they're expecting a new wave of MPLs. And we are talking about uh, more developed markets, markets where the properties are way more leveraged than in our Southeastern Europe markets. So uh, those are uh, developed markets and what investors are looking here, or oh, looking there. Uh, talking about Serbia, uh, basically we have uh, traditionally very few active investors. Uh, 15 years ago, those was Austrian developers and uh, Israeli uh, developers. Uh, after that, uh, South African capital flow in. And at the moment, we see one Russian fund and we see one Israeli investor developer, which are quite aggressive on the market and they are buying almost all properties. So we are seeing two names uh, behind almost every transaction. And other than that, we see just a local group of investor uh, which are buying uh, good opportunities, basically some soft NPLs or something like that. So traditionally we are not talking about, let's say desire or uh, long-term strategies, we are talking about specific time, specific investor, specific interest. So these two funds, two, these two investors are very active at the moment, and we are not sure who's going to be active in uh, one year or two years, but uh, having a history and track record in mind, again, we are going to have someone else. If not South African, if not uh, Russians or, and Israelis, then it's going to be a Korean capital, which, where entire UK and uh, Western Europe are talking about, or some other capital coming into this uh, segment, or someone withdrawing their money from stock exchange uh, all over the world, which is, they believe, overpriced and coming to real estate. So uh, today we have a very clear picture who's buying and what they're buying, which means, and still we cannot say who's going to buy in a year or two years. Mm -hmm. We are going to buy in a year, in two years. <laughs> well, uh, and about Lidl, are you expanding to Bosnia? Do you want to say something about that? Um, yes. Pa, da, ajde, kad si već, Lidl Srbija je Lidl Srbija. Ali, ka, Aha, za budućnost, ok. Ovaj, kada pričamo o regionu, kao što je nekad davno, prije deset i više godina, Lidl Njemačka razmatrao ovaj region i donio odluku da, da krene u, u ekspanziju u Srbiji. U tom momentu, 2011. godine, kad sam ja tu počela da radim, iskreno bilo je, kao što je neko na prethodnim panelima već pomenuo, bilo je praktično uspavanih gradova. Uopšte nije bilo aktivnosti u oblasti nekretnina i gradnje. Ja konkretno koja sam bila zadužena od početka za Beograd, u Beogradu sam mogla da vidim par gradilišta, mogla sam na prste ruke da, da nabrojim ovaj, ko gradi i šta gradi. Sada je ta situacija dosta drugačija. Hoću da kažem da je Lidl na vrijeme počeo da analizira cijeli region i da Lidl Njemačka naravno razmatra i, i tržište Bosne ali da to nije priča koja je direktno vezana sa Lidl Srbijom, nego to je praktično odvojeno priča koja ide, ide za sebe. I ovaj, ja sam inače rodom iz Bosne i posebno mi je drago što, što će i, i tamo da u bližoj budućnosti bude aktivnosti kao i ovdje. O, nekretnine su vrlo zahtjevne, pošto mi kupujemo svoje placeve uglavnom i gradimo svoje objekte. A, tu je neophodna višegodišnja priprema. Mi smo u Srbiji potrošili... Ne znam, evo, ako, ako smo otvorili 2018. onda zamislite kolika je priprema bila ispred toga više godišnja. Znači, sedam godina smo se spremali za to da bismo imali ovako uh, kontinuiran um, rast u oblasti, uh, u oblasti 
food retail što se tiče nekretnina, da bismo kontinuirano otvarali naše prodavnice i krenuli sa tim velikim brojem na jedan dan kako smo i krenuli. Tako da vjerujem da će kolege u Bosni da imaju jednako uspješnu priču kao mi i eto, možda nije moja ekspertiza da pričam o Lidlu u Bosni, ali vama sam sad malo otkrila da se o tome vrlo detaljno razmatra, analizira i da čućete uskoro sve. Sigurno sam. A vjerujem već da Nebojča ti vrlo dobro znaš. Nisam znao da je tajna, izvinjavam se. Nije, nije tajna. Mislim, nije tajna. To je prosto sad već negdje i oglašeno. Praktično, mi dok analiziramo, nikad ne znamo, ne izlazimo u javnost zato što ne znamo kada konkretno kreće koja priča, ali sada je već izašla vijest u javnost, tako da Eto, bit će prilike da čujemo u nekim budućim konferencijama što se i tamo dešava, nadam se. Ana, one question. How many shops do you have already in Serbia and how much can you still grow? Aha, pa mi do sada imamo otvorenih 47. To je otvorenih filijala, ali mnogo još planiramo, ajde da kažem da ih otvorimo. Konkretan broj ne bismo govorili jer se prosto on mijenja u zavisnosti od toga što se dešava na tržištu. Hoću samo da kažem da je naš plan, naš cilj je vrlo jasan, vrlo jednostavan, a to je da vi svi kupujete u Lidlu. Onda možete da zamislite koliki će to broj filijala da bude jednog dana. Da svima bude lagano, da svima bude usput i da svi mogu relativno brzo da završe svoju kupovinu. Tako da... We do our best to support you. Of course. Čekam vas, imate vi zanimljive lokacije za nas. Vrlo ja dobro pratim šta vi radite. Milica, do you have any words on future GTC developments? Well, this was actually announced, I think, a week or two ago, but I'll just mention it again. So GTC is planning to develop one more uh, office building uh, in, uh, of course, Milutina Milankovića Street, where else? Uh, and uh, the building is called the GTC X and plan delivery is uh, Q4 2022. Uh, it's a uh, office building of uh, 17,000 square meter GLA, eight floors with, uh, plus the ground floor and uh, 330 uh, parking spaces. So. These are, to say, the most uh, recent, recent uh, or the closest plans for GTC in Serbia. Uh, does the does the X stand for ten or? No, it uh, well, it stands for the shape. Uh, okay, oh, okay, okay. So the development is in the X shape. Okay, X marks the spot. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great. When it will be completed? What is the time? Uh, the completion is uh, planned for uh, Q4, uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. Elisa, do you want to share with us a transaction that took place or it's taking place right now for your asset or it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what are we talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Uh, uh, Ivan, Ivan. Um, uh, you work uh, in the Foreign uh, Investors Council. What are the latest uh, FIC activities in the real estate infrastructure industry? Are you involved in any regulatory activities at the moment? Uh, yes, we are very active in regulatory activities. We have uh, excellent communication with the Ministry of um, uh, Construction, uh, Traffic and Infrastructure, as well as with the Ministry of Mining and Energy. We have just uh, finalized uh, um, input and comments to the new draft law on renewables, which was mentioned in some of the previous panel. I mean, this sector of renewable energy is uh, uh, very important for this year as part of the overall in, in infrastructure. Um, uh, majority of our comments were accepted. So we see that this platform is uh, definitely a good tool for investors to um, to influence and to shape uh, the regulations which are um, affecting their everyday business, of course. 
Uh, and when it comes to construction industry, um, we are thinking about uh, trying to, I, we see that this conversion of right of use uh, uh, on the land into ownership is still not completed. Even this was initiated uh, since 2009. And now this is 2021 and we still have uh, uh, state owned land, right of use on it. Uh, we still have even social ownership, which is a relic from the past. Uh, so we are thinking now to put a few new ideas and solutions to suggest the Ministry of Construction how to deal with it faster. This becomes highly important uh, question for even during this pandemic, given that a lot of uh, very attractive locations are blocked because the conversion fee could amount several uh, hundred thousands, even about one million euros. So hopefully we will we will get to some uh, some good solution and proposal to the ministry on that. And if you just allow me, just uh, just a short note. Speaking of risks, um, uh, when uh, conducting a M and A real estate transaction, especially during the pandemic, it's not directly linked to the pandemic. But we see that uh, uh, each year, uh, almost every year, we have more and more. Uh, w and I, this is a warranty and indemnity insurance policies uh, taking place and being uh, acquired for uh, completion of the transaction and title insurance as well. So those two products are not, um, it's not possible to buy that in Serbia, but there are each year more and more insurance companies uh, who are uh, interested in, uh, uh, in selling those products here. So this is an excellent tool to ease and to close the transaction, shifting uh, the liabilities uh, from the seller to the insurance companies. Especially important during the, the, the unpredictable uh, uh, risks and uncertainty that pandemic caused. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, maybe uh, a few minutes more. Uh, uh, I'd just like to, one last question maybe for Ivana. Uh, you sold a portfolio for retail parks in Serbia pretty recently. Which ones are they? Uh, what kind of uh, you know, effects was the pandemic on, on the transaction? And uh, what do you think uh, the overall effect of the investment market in CEE region? Hi, yes, uh, yes, we did sell four retail parks, our entire portfolio currently in Serbia to uh, an Austrian investor, Imo Finance. I think it's, it's known to pretty much everyone now. Uh, and this was actually a first completely virtual transaction. So from the start to the finish, uh, the principals never met in person. It was all done through video calls and conference calls. Uh, actually, Ivan was our, our uh, legal support on this one, and I'm uh, going to use the chance again to thank him here. Uh, mm -hmm. And surprisingly, uh, I think this was actually went very smooth, considering the, the fact that it was done in a completely different way to how transactions have been done so far. We started negotiations sometime, I think, in the second quarter last year, and by the end of the year, we signed it. Uh, so I think everyone knows that real estate is not a very liquid asset class and it's not unusual for transactions of this size and this complexity to take a very long time. But I think we even beat the records of, of some pre-COVID time transactions in the, when it comes to completion. Uh, obviously, we did have some you know, technical challenges in terms of meeting because we can meet, but uh, this maybe even made the whole thing a little bit easier for, uh, for some long-term players on the market because uh, there was kind of a, a separation uh, of, of some previously seen investors with some limited experience. So the ones that know the market very well uh, had kind of an open field uh, to, to work and to get transactions done. Uh, we at Poseidon, uh, where we have built one of the first retail parks in Serbia, I think, and 
I think the largest one in, in Belgrade that we sold uh, the year before. And we have sold all together then to very uh, well-known international retail investors at, I have to say, a record market price. We find this to be a testament to our location, our design, our management, and our brand. So uh, if, I, if I would have to say if COVID had an effect on, on our business, I would say it had a good effect on our business. We were really successful in the past period. And we definitely plan on staying in the market and expanding further in the market, not just in Serbia, but also in Croatia, where we have a lot more assets uh, under management. You, you've sold, you sold assets to Emo Finance before? No, this was, this, was, this was our first transaction with Emo Finance. We sold a retail park in Belgrade uh, previous to that to an Israeli <laughs> investor. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I thought maybe if the two parties had known each other, it would be much easier, but these two parties hadn't met before, so so I could see uh, where there might be more difficulties, but I'm uh, glad to hear that it went very smoothly. Well, I think that Imo Finance is, is a player who's been in the market for quite a long time. They know the market well, and, and this was the factor yeah. that made things uh, a lot easier, I would say. Yeah. I don't see I don't see any questions in the in the chat area. Does anybody else want to want to weigh in? I think our, our time is uh, pretty well up. I think we maybe have another minute or so. Anybody else have anything they want to to finish with? No. Okay. Well, I'll give the floor back to Yagoda. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you participants for listening. I hope you enjoyed the, the panel and I hope it was uh, rewarding. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank your panelists. Uh, this, this was really crucial topic, if, if I may say, especially now in this COVID uh, situation now here in Serbia and in the whole world as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>